in the program, as you know, on the Ecological Regents of Texas. And she's been coming to talk to the training classes for three years. You will see all of the pins on her badge. Each of those represents something significant that she <laughs> has done, as well as the thousands of hours she has spent doing things that she loves for Master Naturalist. And I'm not kidding when I say thousands of hours because they've all been well documented. And I'm going to shift here. This is Ron Fellows. He's been recognized by the President of the United States for his out thousands of hours, but for the contributions that he has made, not only to Texas Master Naturalist, but to other things that promote our mission. So back to Joanne. She's an artist, an illustrator, a web designer. She's proficient in technology, as you will see during her presentation. Joanne and her husband, Ron, have created two amazing, amazing projects. And in your um, September newsletter, you read this article about what they have done at Heritage Elementary School. So specifically, that project is called Texas Our Heritage, and it's the Heritage Elementary School in Highland Village. And they that together, they also did another amazing project that's called Trails of Denton County. So as you listen to her, you will see, you will hear, that she is a master, master naturalist. And we're very lucky to hear from her today. Thank you, Joanne. <laughs> I'm not sure she's, oh, whoops. Then she turns me off. Um, I'm not sure she's talking about me. You're going to probably hear very little from me today. Uh, what I've brought for you today is Texas Parks and Wildlife videos. So this is going to be like one, one long movie short, one after another with me kind of keeping pace in between with just a little bit. So this first half is going to run a little bit shorter than the second half. So I may send you to break early, that way we can accumulate the time for your questions at the end. So and I'll try to help you with anything. I've given you a handout of the Texas Parks and Wildlife web links that I often use. And the reason I gave you a handout was because you wouldn't be able to scribble those down in the amount of time. They love to change things on their website. And so sometimes you have to ferret to find stuff. So these are my favorite happy places to go. Uh, check them out. You might find something that interests you. So like I said, we're, most of the eco-regions that we're going to cover, I use little snippets or little movies from Texas Parks and Wildlife. This is the same video footage that I took uh, to use at Heritage Garden so that I could immerse the kids when they're out in the garden and they hold their iPads up to a sign. They can be immersed in the sounds and the sights and the animals that are in that particular eco-region. So what makes or defines an eco-region? Are you ready for this? The definition is an ecoregion is an area defined by its environmental conditions, especially climate, landforms, and soil characteristics. The character of the East Texas Piney Woods is very different from the character of the Trans Pecos. So we're going. Okay, let me do that again, then I can hear it when it's talking to you. An ecoregion is an area defined by its environmental conditions, especially climate, landforms, and soil characteristics. You guys just had uh, geology, and you learned about how the soil and the landforms were formed. So the character of your East Texas Piney Woods is obviously going to be much different than the Trans-Pecos. This first map shows you 10 ecoregions. Texas Parks and Wildlife has decided on these 10 areas. If you look at number one, that's the East Texas Piney Woods. If you look at number 10, that's Trans-Pecos that I was talking about. Next to it is a rainfall map. 
If you notice, the rain collects in Texas in a north-south set of bands. So in the piney woods, you've got 54 inches of rain as an average. In Trans-Pecos, you have 14. Here we are in uh, 3, 4, and 5, which is kind of blackland, prairie, cross timbers, wherever you folks kind of live, uh, the post oaks. That gets about 35 inches, somewhere in there. So you can see how that rainfall is going to change the plants and the animals. The one map I didn't bother putting up today is your rivers map. The rivers start up in area nine, eight or nine up around the panhandle, and they flow across Texas down to the Gulf of Mexico. That river flow, or all those major rivers, are also going to, to impact those ecoregions. In one big fat ecoregion, like it just showed you, there are all sorts of little tiny ones. Sometimes there's little tiny specialty ones, and we're going to be looking at a couple of those, as well as some of the endangered species. So like I said, we have a group of videos to show you, so I'm just going to keep showing you little video after little video with minor interruptions. Uh, I told her to have popcorn for you, but she didn't listen to me. Your Texas Parks and Wildlife. We're going to start with one of their first series, which is Keep Texas Wild. And on those video links, you can go see the whole video if I've piqued your interest today. Um, Texas Parks and Wildlife has an overall wildlife management plan. And you'll see in these videos, and I want you to pay attention in these videos, to see what they're doing in order to manage individual ecoregions as well as all of state of Texas. It's important because we as volunteers back up that effort. And in there you'll see some hints as to how you, as a new master naturalist, can help. Texas is a land of breathtaking beauty and diversity. From the vast horizons and the rugged mountains of the west to the subtropical brush country of South Texas, the untamed canyons of the Panhandle, to the deep and fertile woods and quiet marshes on the coast. And linking it all together, the winding streams and rivers that connect these ecologically diverse regions. Each region of Texas is rich in biodiversity, with unique habitats that support a multitude of different species, species that depend on one another for survival. But as our state's population continues to grow, so does the impact on habitat for fish, wildlife, and people. Is there a way we can keep Texas wild? Humans are an integral part of this landscape we think of as nature, completely dependent on the world around us for survival. But as technology has progressed, we've learned how to alter our environment, alter it almost beyond recognition. Most of us now live in a world so removed from the balance of nature, we've forgotten the role each living thing plays. Every species within a particular habitat has its own role. It has a, the, the food that it eats, it has the place that it uh, lives, it has its, its standard impacts to the habitat. If a particular habitat or a particular ecological system collapses, it really means it changes. It means that what once provided habitat, food, water, shelter for numerous species doesn't provide for those species anymore. I think we have to consider ourselves, human beings, as part of the natural ecosystems. I think we've got to find ways for us to be able to have our habitat without destroying or impacting the habitat for everything else. To meet these challenges, Texas Parks and Wildlife, working with a host of conservation partners, developed the Wildlife Action Plan. 
The plan is a proactive ecosystem approach. And what that means is that we look at each of the different ecosystems. We look at their wildlife, their plants, their water systems, and how they function together as well as separately to see how we can best affect good management throughout the state. This video will address the most critical habitats in Texas, the problems they face, and discuss actions we can take to conserve wildlife and vital natural areas for future generations. As you can see, they're very well done videos, so you should enjoy them on your own or there will be parts of this later on today. We're going to look at the very first zone, the East Texas Piney Woods. Even though we call it East Texas Piney Woods, it is actually part of a much larger woodland that goes on up into Arkansas and Oklahoma and across over into Louisiana. So it's a fairly good sized woodland. You'll find that in a lot of situations, it's not just Texas's problem to manage an area. We have to go across state lines. This area has one of those little tiny ecosystems that's quite unique, and it's called the Big Thicket. Sometimes um, the managers of the Big Thicket area will come out and talk to our group at one of our meetings, and it's really quite interesting. It is a, a drive from here, but you can, you know, organize field trip. It's, it's interesting, but if you do, make sure you are covered well for mosquitoes if it's mosquito season. It's worth the drive and worth fighting the mosquitoes for it. The other major thing in this area is Cattle Lake, and you will hear over time that Cattle Lake is our one natural lake. In this area, you have uh, lots of woodpeckers, but one of the eight species of woodpeckers, oops, one of the, hello, one of the eight species of woodpeckers is this little red cockaded woodpecker. What makes it unique is it builds its home in live trees. It drills its hole, the sap oozes out. When it hardens, it gets slick, and that helps defend the nest against predators such as snakes, uh, which you can imagine if you're in the, the bayous or the bayous that uh, there might be just a few of those floating around. Uh, they, what makes them uh, special and more or less endangered is the fact that they require uh, 60 to 70-year-old trees. In these bayous, you'll find over 70 special species of fish. And like I said, the Cattle Lake just doesn't belong to us. It sprawls over into Louisiana. So again, this has to become an uh, interstate in order to protect this particular area. The lake is a cypress swamp with lots of Spanish moss hanging from the trees. It's uh, very surreal. Just the scenery of Cattle Lake, it excites the imagination. In the piney woods of northeast Texas, straddling the Louisiana border, is a place equally rich in history, biodiversity and scenic beauty, Caddo Lake. Caddo Lake is the largest naturally formed freshwater lake in Texas. It's been around for hundreds of years. Since it's such an old lake, it's uh, very diverse in both fish species, uh, bird species. There's uh, a lot of plant and animal life that depend on the lake. Humans have long depended on this lake as well, dating back to the Caddo Indians and early Texas settlers. From about 1840 through a little after 1900, a lot of people in cargo came in and out of Texas across Caddo Lake and up and down Big Cypress Bayou. Steamboats were actually able to travel all the way from New Orleans up to the port of Jefferson. At that time, uh, Jefferson was the busiest inland port in Texas. Watch your ship right here. The boat traffic is different now. But Cattle Lake remains as timeless as ever. It looks like it's gone back in time, doesn't it? It looks prehistoric. Dave Lomax spends his time helping Caddo Lake State Park visitors see the lake up close. Now, this is big cypress value here. The way to experience Caddo Lake is to get on a boat and go. Go down the backwaters. Go through the hidden bayous. It's an experience that uh, 
bird watchers, fishermen, hunters, hikers, canoeists, anybody can enjoy it. Two feet deep, exactly. Had a lake depth finder. <laughs> if you either don't have time or can't afford a boat, you can get a really good feel for what Cattle Lake is like standing at the end of our observation pier on the Sawmill Pond. We have uh, exhibits at our visitor center that give people a sense for what's out there. And we have volunteer-led nature hikes. They're beautiful, beautiful little flower. Late March, early April, when the dogwoods are blooming, I think that's the prettiest time of year. Each season has its uniqueness. Wow! Along the forest trail, hikers can explore bottomland hardwoods, upland pine forest, and even a little state park they history. always use native stone, native wood. This was one of the first five projects that the CCC worked on in Texas. We've completely renovated the nine cabins. The exteriors are the way the CCC built them. The interiors are 100% remodeled. They're, they're really nice. From the comfort of a log cabin nestled in the pines, or from a boat gliding through the cypress, it's easy to see why Caddo Lake has become legendary among Texas state parks. I've been here all my life, and I never get tired of looking at it. It gives me a good feeling to see first-timers come down here and be awed by the beauty of Caddo Lake. For more information about Texas State Parks and Historic Sites, visit our website or call 1-800-792-1112. We're going to look... Is this, is this working? Okay. Yes? Okay, we're going to now work, look at uh, our second. Okay. They're saying no. I can shout. <laughs> Will that do? I've been known to project to the back row. This has no red light. No red light. <clears throat> well, I'm going to project to the back row because that no longer has a red light. Oh, okay. All right. Zone two is your is going to be one of a fairly large zone for us to cover. So don't worry, the movies kind of go on forever. Um, it's the Gulf Coast prairies and marshes. This is where it, we have a lot of wildlife refuge, ref, refuges and a lot of endangered species, and I wanted to cover those. The Gulf Coast is actually a very, very narrow 60-mile wide band that goes all the way down the coast of Texas. So it's quite an interesting area. This particular photo is of a rancis, which I often go to as a birder and highly recommend it. So you will also see in here that the coastal dunes are very important in the fall to the peregrine falcon. We won't be covering him today, but that's just one of many. The Gulf Coast prairies and marshes ecoregion represents a fusion of marine and terrestrial habitats. Geographically, the region spans from the eastern border of Texas and Louisiana to the southern tip of the state, bordering Mexico. Home to the longest barrier islands in the United States, the Texas Gulf Coast is comprised of sandy beaches and dunes, grasslands, numerous wetlands, and estuaries that provide refuge for a host of aquatic and wildlife species. Historically, this area of Texas was covered by over 9 million acres of native grasslands and wetlands. The coastal prairie was occasionally interrupted by forested areas, bordering the many rivers winding to the Gulf of Mexico. But over time, the human population increased and the landscape began to change. People settled here. They stopped uh, wildfires because it wasn't good for their livelihood. They cleared the prairie for agriculture. They grew crops so they could make a living. People settled in cities, built industries. And as a result, they cleared essentially 90% of the prairie. All of this land fragmentation and conversion has changed river flows. It has affected the water quality of marshes and estuaries. Although conservation efforts over the past few years have helped species like the endangered whooping crane improve, the same cannot be said for the Atwater's prairie chicken, one of the original inhabitants of the Gulf Coast prairie. 
The coastal prairie was the home of the Atwater's uh, prairie chicken. When the people first arrived here, there were hundreds of thousands of them. Today, we only have a few dozen left in the wild. The population primarily crashed due to habitat loss when the land was converted to cities and agriculture or planted into them these exotic grasses for livestock production. The chickens have uh, more or less went the way of the habitat and we're busily working with these private landowners in this part of Texas to try to restore uh, the Atwater's prairie chicken. Habitat fragmentation is the real enemy of the Atwater's prairie chicken. There is simply not enough connected prairie to sustain the species. With every new road and community established to support an ever-increasing Texas population, more fragmentation occurs. These days, the Atwater's prairie chicken is raised in zoos and released in the wild in hopes they will increase their numbers on their own. We estimate you need in the neighborhood of 80,000 acres of connected grasslands for the chickens to survive. So even though you may have patches in different places of a few hundred to a few thousand acres, if they're not connected, these species depending upon these grasslands will disappear or they will not do as well as they should. The Atwater's prairie chicken is not the only species struggling to survive along the Gulf Coast. Native species like the bobwhite quail and the mottled duck are also experiencing a dramatic decline in populations due to decreasing prairie and wetland habitats. Something else that has declined over time is the occurrence of wildfire. For the most part, wildfires are contained today to protect homes, cities, and industry. Keepers of the prairie now use prescribed or controlled burns to help sustain what is left of the native prairie habitat. In areas that manage very heavily for wildlife, control burns is a regular management tool. Uh, we use it in woodlands, we use it in the coastal marshes, we use it in these uh, prairies here, and it does basically the same job every time. It sets back succession, controls the sharp, woody plants, allows the herbaceous plants to be more vigorous and more productive. Landowners use it at some scale throughout Texas, but by and large we have a high uses of in the prairie because one, fire is essential for the prairie to maintain itself as a prairie, and two, we have organizations here which are funding prescribed burn on private property. The Texas Gulf Coast is also an annual stopover point for thousands of neotropical migratory birds. Songbirds, hummingbirds, birds of prey, all depend heavily on the coastal marshes. Degraded habitat not only means fewer safe harbors for migratory birds, but a threatened cycle of life for many other species. We have a lot of gulls, terns, egrets, and herons, which eat a lot of fish and shrimp in the marshes. And these marshes are really productive for wetland-dependent wildlife. Most of our waterfowl, most of our fur bearers, and many of our birds depend upon these uh, marshes for their survival. What's happening in Texas, urbanization, industry, taking up huge acres of marshland, we also creating navigation corridors for our shipping. The degradation of this ecoregion also impacts outdoor recreation, which helps support the Gulf Coast economy. Whether bird watching or beach combing, declining habitats mean declining income for the area. Striving to achieve balance for all the needs placed on the Gulf Coast prairies and marshes will be an ongoing process as our population grows. Private landowners will continue to be key players in helping maintain this eco-region. I'm going to show you two more short videos, one about the whooping crane and one about the efforts to uh, save the Kemp Ridley sea turtle, which happens to be my little favorite guy. When it's first light, that's the best time to be here. Because they're up and they're moving, and especially if it's cold, they're moving. 
and you never know what you're going to see when you go around the curve. You don't know what's, what's going to be on the other side. That kind of adds to the mystique of the whole thing. It's a great place to be. For thousands of years, the wetlands and marshes along the Texas Gulf Coast have provided a rich habitat for many species of plants and animals. But these habitats began to disappear in the early 1900s. In the 1930s, America was going through a drought and waterfowl populations were in trouble all around the country. And so in 1937, Franklin Roosevelt signed an executive order which established the refuge and set it aside for waterfowl and migratory bird management. The Aransas National Wildlife Refuge is surrounded by bay waters. Its marshes are home to a variety of plants and animals, from waterfowl to the American alligator. Moving inland, dense thickets provide shelter for white-tailed deer, javelina, coyotes, and raccoons. Although the refuge is set aside for wildlife, visitors have a place here, too. We've seen more ducks than I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> and, more, and more geese. Uh -huh. The Wildlife Interpretive Center houses an exhibit that features the species and habitats of the region. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. just a little to the left and over uh -huh. near the other shore, you can uh -huh. see just two little spots. Uh oh. Can you see them? See those two things that are in yeah. the water? Just go to the right of that, or that little spit of land. You see them? They're pretty. This is a beautiful place here, isn't it? Sure is. We come down every year. All the way from New York. Even though, even though they're so far away, is it still worth it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Why is it? Because they're... Oh, this is just lovely. Rancis is marvelous. This is a real nature. OK. The funny part about trimming one of these trails, when you turn around and come back up the trail, it looks worse than it did when you went down, almost. You have to trim it again. There were stumps down there. Uh, how long, how long oh, how long have we been volunteering? <laughs> yeah. It has been years. Well, we are professional volunteers. <laughs> by that, by that we, we do it any place we can, any time somebody needs our services. The Aransas National Wildlife Refuge is the winter home to a diverse bird population. Almost 400 species have been documented here. But the most famous wintertime resident is the whooping crane. This is the only place that a natural wild flock winters anywhere in, in the world. I mean, whooping cranes, there are only about 430 in North America and about 200 in this Texas wintering flock. Of course, it's still endangered. We're still in the initial stages of saving the species. We've got a long way to go. This majestic red-headed bird is the largest in North America. Standing five feet tall, its black-tipped wings span seven and a half feet in flight. From late October until mid-April, the whoopers winter along 35 miles of Texas coast. Here they relax in the marshes, feeding on crabs and acorns, raising their young. They establish their own territory at the refuge and will return to exactly the same area year after year. But even after half a century of protection, the whooper is still in danger. We just know they're not safe. We're trying to get a second and then a third flock established. And then at that point, we feel we could take the bird off the endangered species list. And that is the overall goal of what we're trying to do. And other dangers loom just over the horizon. One of those major threats right now is the continued decrease of freshwater inflows. What's happening is this. 
more and more water is being diverted from rivers upstream to be used by people, industry, and agriculture. But doing this reduces the amount of fresh water that flows all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. The result? Estuaries are robbed of the nutrients that keep marine ecosystems in balance. For the whooping crane, this break in the aquatic food chain would be devastating. And the trend is continuing. There's no mechanism to leave adequate amounts of water in the river. And that situation has to be reversed or the whooping crane is going to go extinct. For the first time in the history of the refuge, the whooping crane population will exceed 200 birds. But its future remains tenuous so long as the species must rely so heavily on the wintering grounds here at Aransas. The reason that we need another flock of whooping cranes is this flock is so vulnerable. But all we need is one hurricane in November that could wipe out two-thirds of the flock. That fact keeps the biologists forever on edge, knowing that a single disaster could wipe out 50 years of hard work. They were once only 15 whooping cranes wintering in Texas, and they were so rare, and they've made such a comeback that they really symbolize conservation in North America of what man can accomplish if man steps in and adequately protects the species and, and allows it to make a comeback. I love working and living around the ocean. The sound of the surf, looking out into the ocean, I can't imagine being anywhere else. I am Dr. Donna Shaver, and I lead the Kempsterly Sea Turtle Recovery Project here at Padre Island National Seashore. Kemp's Ridley is an endangered species that was almost obliterated within just a blink of an eye and it became endangered because of human activities. And it's gonna take human activities to help conserve that animal and to keep it on this planet for the future. There's still a long way to go to recover the population of the Kemp's Ridley Sea Turtle. There was a film that was made in 1947 that showed an estimated 40,000 Kemp's Ridley's nesting at Rancho Nuevo on just one day. By the time that biologists went to the nesting beach to try to investigate, the number of Kemp's Ridley's nesting had already plummeted due to the loss of eggs, due to intentional taking of the eggs from the nesting beach, as well as loss of the juveniles and adults due to fisheries operations. The Kemp's Ridley population continued to decline to a low of only 702 nests worldwide for 1985. A project was started as a safeguard against extinction so that if a political or environmental catastrophe occurred at Rancho Nuevo, there'd be a safe area in the U.S. where Kemp's Ridley's could nest and be protected. From 1978 to 1988, 22,507 Kemp's Ridley sea turtle eggs were brought to Padre Island National Seashore for incubation in an attempt to establish a secondary nesting colony because Kemp's Ridley is a native nester to South Texas. What we tried to do was to imprint the turtles to Padre Island National Seashore. The hatchlings were released on the beach, allowed to crawl into the surf where they were recaptured using aquarium dip nets. 
Then the hatchlings were sent to the National Marine Fishery Service Laboratory in Galveston, Texas, where they were raised for approximately 9 to 11 months. And that allowed the turtles to grow to a size large enough so that they could be tagged for future recognition and also to be able to avoid most predators when they were released. And that's a big turtle. It's about three feet long. And it took a full 10 years before we found our first confirmed returnee from that project. And it was an extremely happy day. Look at her. We knew that these turtles were from the project because they had on them living tags. A living tag is like a skin graft where there was a piece of the bottom shell taken out, a piece of the top shell, and that small plug from the bottom shell was glued into the surrounding shell surface on the top, providing a permanent light identification marker on the darker background of the top shell. Okay, there's the egg cavity with the eggs. So there's about 100. This is very significant for us in that we've got the first uh, documented evidence of a sea turtle of any species that's been experimentally imprinted to a particular area to return to that area to nest. Oh, I love this job. We're looking for sea turtle tracks primarily. We're looking for those nesting turtles. We go for their eggs and we bring them into the hatching facility. We got six nests my first year and now to get a day when we get 19 in one day is just, it's so exciting. I can't tell you how much it means. It's nice to know that we'll be able to pass through this life and leave the earth a little bit better place than it was when we got here. This is the track left in the sand by the nesting female. This is what we're looking for when we're patrolling. As you can see, it's about a foot and a half to two feet wide, and there's scuff marks from the flippers and little divots in the sand that are made from the nails on the flippers as the turtle crawls up the beach or back down into the water. Nesting camps really sea turtles are only on the beach for about 45 minutes. She lays the eggs. They come out in one or two or three at a time. They provide no maternal care for their eggs and don't return to the nest site. When the turtle is done, she will cover that nest cavity and she returns to the sea. It's very important that you watch carefully for nesting camps Ridley turtles. They are very slow and they can't move to avoid an approaching vehicle. This is a species that's been around for four million years. I feel like we've got an obligation to try to bring this species back so that it can be enjoyed by future generations. We work so hard to find Kempsterly nests on the Texas coast. Sometimes, despite hours of digging and of probing, we're unable to find the nest and protect those eggs. So when possible, we call in the expert sniffer, my Karen Terrier Ridley, who we've trained to aid with nest detection. Find the nest, Ridley. When we bring Ridley to a site, he aggressively sniffs on the beach, trying to find where that nest is located, and he really enjoys doing this. Find that nest, Ridley. Where's that nest? And the little dog, we could have spent five hours probing and digging, bring him in, and within a matter of just minutes, he locates the nest. There's a nest. Oh, good boy, Ridley. You found it. You found it. Oh, good boy. The eggs are collected from all of the nests that we find on the Texas coast and brought in for protected incubation. The incubation temperature determines whether the turtles will be male or female. Warmer temperatures produce females, cooler temperatures males. We try to hatch mostly females so that they'll have a better chance of reproduction in the wild. During the 
day of the release, the turtles are immediately brought down to the beach and they're placed on the beach and allowed to enter the surf and go free. These animals are, are pretty primitive animals and basically are working on instinct right now. Um, smelling the salt air, hearing the waves probably, and just making a mad dash towards the water to try to get in there as quickly as they can. They're free and they're going to be on this uh, journey that's going to last their whole lifetime. After many years of hard work by many people, both in Mexico and the United States, the Kemp's Ridley population is increasing. For the future, we're going to have to continue our very hard work. This is an endangered species success story in the making. I hope you enjoyed those and learned some stuff. We're going to start the first of the three prairies. This is kind of the area that we live in. It's those three long strips. Gets about 35 inches of rain. The post oak savanna is, is like your East Pine, Texas piney woods. It starts, it's part of a great oak forest that started up in Canada and goes all the way down into Central America. So it's not just our little patch. The one movie I have for you is pretty far down in that little strip out of, out of our territory. But next to it, uh, the state park is a uh, pristine acreage of post oak savanna. So the post oak savanna, the, the two things you need to know, like you need to know about most prairies, is they were managed by frequent fire and usually by grazers like, like bison, which obviously now that it's populated, we don't have those two features. So who lives on a post oak savanna? Mostly your big grazers, uh, a lot of, of small grassland birds and things. Because of the oaks, you have the squirrels and other things like that, and then of course predators. So it, it's a pretty diverse little population. Guadalupe River State Park was created to provide river access to the public. What's so unusual about this park is that we're very close to San Antonio. We're just 30 miles. We're very close to Austin, just an hour and a half south. And yet, you can come here in a short amount of time and be completely removed from the city life. So you really accomplish the outdoor experience very, very quickly. Guadalupe River is also the only state park with a state natural area right next door. Between Honey Creek and Guadalupe, we have nearly 5,000 acres of pristine post oak savanna. Now, the difference between Honey Creek State Natural Area and Guadalupe River State Park is that we manage the state natural area for its cultural natural resources. You can only come into Honey Creek under experimental permit if you're doing research here or we have Saturday morning guided tours that are from 9 to 11 a.m. This is probably the reason you came. This is Honey Creek. It's uh, never stopped flowing that, that we know of. We're going to try this fossil right here. See this round one right here? We have an agreement with the Northeast Independent School District in San Antonio and we've got a third grade outdoor science program that goes on here during fall and also during the spring. They actually get to come out here and see and feel and touch and they get to observe nature right here in real life. It's here for them. A special trail over in the state park welcomes visitors with hooves as well as feet. This is just the second time we've been out here, but we really enjoyed it the first time we came a week ago, so we're going to keep a regular weekly trail ride session going. It's certainly very peaceful getting away from city and noise and it's quiet and beautiful and it's a way to relax with your... Many different features draw people. 
I'm going to stop the movie there because it just starts talking about the state park next door. It was very hard for me to find a video that could show you what a true post oak savanna should look like. So that, that, that little bit down in Honey Creek is kind of what's left. Our next one is the Blackland Prairie. It's the second in, of the prairies, that second strip. Remember your geology where they talked about the, uh, that inland sea that came in and went out and came in and went out and made the deposits? Well, the Blackland Prairie is one of those areas where you can kind of see um, more of the evidence of, of that ancient sea. Prior to the 17th century, this area had 12 million acres, 12 million acres of tall grass prairie. Now there's less than 5,000. If you want to see a restored sample, uh, the Heard Museum is trying. So that's kind of about all we can do. The Texas Blackland Prairie. It stretches from the Red River to the city of San Antonio and covers more than 19,000 square miles. Historically, this was a land of wildflowers and grasses, such as blue still, gamma grass, and Indian grass. Periodic fire suppressed dense woody vegetation and allowed tall grasses to flourish. Here on the prairie, millions of bison and antelope grazed. There are pioneers that wrote in their diaries as they crossed the Blackland Prairies, this sea of grass, rolling, gently rolling hills of grass and wildflowers, and they describe it as one of the most beautiful landscapes they'd ever seen. Keep in mind, many of them came from Europe, which were forested systems, they, and they were calling these grassland habitats extremely beautiful. So it was a landscape that was wide open, a landscape that was seemingly boundless. But as new settlers discovered the beauty of Texas, they also found that the rich soil of the Blackland Prairie was ripe for cultivation. Gradually, the diverse grasslands began a conversion to farmland, and the age of agriculture had arrived. Crops like cotton, corn, and milo were big business in Texas. The Blackland Prairie has extremely fertile soil, very deep, very rich in organic matter, these prairies being converted to plowed fields and grazing pastures. As a result of that change, there were introduced species being brought in, like Johnson grass, coastal Bermuda. One of the major challenges for managing a Blackland Prairie is managing these species to keep them from taking over. Today, the Blackland Prairie is one of the most severely altered in the state. Much of the farmland of the past has yielded to the continuing sprawl from our cities, as urban development now takes up a majority of this ecoregion. Sadly, only 1% of native Blackland Prairie habitat remains. The Blackland Prairie in its history has suffered several different phases of major impacts. The first being agriculture, and the second being what we're seeing today, which is residential development, commercial development, and this vast wave of urbanization that seems to be taking over the state. You don't really see effective and efficient use of land area until you have constraints on land area. If you think about Manhattan Island, it's limited, it's an island. And so they had no way to go out, so they had to go up. In Texas, there's this mentality that we can keep going out forever. So what we're seeing is urbanization just sprawling out all over the, uh, the habitats surrounding our urban areas. Along with the rapid population growth and urban sprawl, a host of land use practices are also changing in the Blackland Prairie. Improper livestock grazing, fencing, reservoirs and dams, as well as invasive plants and animals. It's no longer the prairies and the cross timbers that we knew 200 years ago. It's now a mix of exotic species. It's a mix of mowed grasses. So the habitat is changing and wildlife species are changing with it as well. One such scenario of change is the decline of grassland nesting birds like the dick sissel. They make their nests in clumps of bunch grass native to the Blackland Prairie. The grassland nesting birds are experiencing a precipitous decline, and what we mean by that is they're declining really, really fast. The dick sissel is a little grassland nesting bird. It nests nowhere else but in grasses. It likes to nest down in the very center of the clumps of grasses. 
and can exist very well in a grazing regime. But if we change to coastal Bermuda grass, they don't have that clump in which to nest, so they're unable to form their nest um, in the same way that they would in a native grassland. So even though they might try to nest there because there's nowhere else to go, uh, very often their nests fail. So what's happening with the Dixissel is happening throughout the state as habitat fragmentation increases, as land use patterns change, as grazing regimes become more intense. We see these same sort of patterns happening throughout the state with other species. Everything is interconnected. When the diversity of plants decline, so does the diversity of wildlife. There is only a small amount of public, private, and nonprofit conservation land currently operated under wildlife management plans. This is why continued public awareness of good land management is critical to conserve our native Texas. Texas Parks and Wildlife and many of its partners offer guidance for landowners to help improve agricultural practices. They also conduct education and encourage policies that limit negative development impacts like erosion and landscape fragmentation. There is an urgent need to restore our remnant prairies and to protect the remaining quality habitat within the Blackland Prairie, an effort that will require the help of all Texans. We have two major prairie projects here. Um, while, we're, while it's fresh in your mind about the land management where they work with homeowners, that gentleman back there, Rob Roy, sitting next to Van, wave your hand, he, has, uh, he manages a project and he even gives training where we go out and uh, we inventory the homeowner's land and we try to help them restore it to a wildlife habitat. So watch for his projects. Uh, the other one is coming up with this next one in, the, in our third or our fifth zone, the Cross Timbers and Prairies. That's where the project uh, Lake Louisville Environmental Learning, or as we start calling it, Leela, Leela, Leela. Uh, because we never want to say Lake Louisville. And I never know if it's Louisville Lake or Lake Louisville. I always, have, I always have to wait for Aaron to tell me before I hike children off into the woods with me going, you called it the wrong thing. They always know the answer. Uh, but this photo that's up here now is from the dam. Uh, it was taken on... Uh, a field trip out there so you can stand up on the dam and you can look at their habitat which is bottom hardwood forest and they are restoring prairie and sometimes if you're wild enough you can join in on a controlled burn I have forbidden him he's my tech expert uh, however I did let him go out and move the fencing for the bison that used to be there unfortunately there's no longer any bison there but your cross timbers is, you're going to hear stories about, because it's, it's strips of heavy, heavy woods, some of them went north-south, so they put those on the map because they'd come out of the Blackland Prairie and they would just run into this wall of woods with hanging greenbriar. The greenbriar is called the Iron Curtain because you can't push through it. Bison can. Uh, so that's one thing that, that you learn. So there are other cross timbers that go uh, along riverbeds. They weren't as important because you couldn't maneuver through them. The cross timbers is important because this is kind of the demarcation line between the east and the west. You will find some mammals and insects that are western and some mammals and insects that will stay in the east. So this is what you need to know about this particular area. So who lived here? This is a fun video to take you to break. And we'll probably break a little bit early uh, so that we can gather up all of our questions at the bitter end of this movie fest. Today, dinosaurs live only in imagination but in some areas their footprints still bear witness to creatures that were once masters of the earth. 
Some of the best preserved evidence of these creatures can be found about an hour's drive from Dallas at Dinosaur Valley State Park. It is here where sauropods, theropods, and duck-billed dinosaurs left their giant footprints in the ancient riverbed, which time has turned to stone. Now this is a foot, Priet! I think. Hey, this really means that dinosaurs are really here. Look, footprints right here! Dinosaurs are, are the greatest thing. They're something, they're, they're big, they're huge, they make a lot of noise, uh, and they're not here anymore. <laughs> Billy Paul Baker has lived and worked with these tracks. He sees this whole experience as a never-ending adventure. See the footprint? Yes. Okay, right Is there. That the yeah, that's a meat eater. He likes to eat that one. Le gusta comer a esos. And that's his toe, his claw. Big old claws on that dinosaur. You know what they use him claws for, I guess. To kill. Yeah. The tracks in this area were first made famous by a paleontologist named Roland T. Byrd. In 1938, he followed a lead to Glen Rose, Texas. Here he found some of the best preserved specimens in the country. Soon he began the monumental job of excavating some of the better tracks. These tracks are now on display in the American Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. They like to come down and explore up and down the river and find the dinosaur footprints and play in the river, uh, hike the trails, uh, ride the bikes up and down the trails, fish the river. Uh, we've got a lot of things to do out here. People enjoy this park, and I've enjoyed the park. The river gets up and goes down, and the tracks are being exposed. Uh, new stuff is coming in there all the time. I think the dinosaurs are a wonderful way of being in a time machine. Kind of being there, it's kind of like being in a Jurassic Park. Ooh, ooh, here they come! <laughs> For more information on Texas State Parks and Historic Sites, visit our website or call 1-800-792-1112. So if you love dinosaurs, the Heard Museum in a very short amount of time, I think just a few days or so, is going to have all of their animatronic dinosaurs set out around in their, in their uh, meadow area and the kids can hike and when you approach it, it roars and it's quite fun. So if you can't make it all the way down to Glen Rose to see the real tracks, you can go out there and see the Disney version. So let's take our 15 minute, what? 10 minute. 10 minute break. She wants time for questions. Don't 